We're live from Auckland Park in Johannesburg as South Africa awaits the return and home soil of the Rugby World Cup record four-time champions. Who are they? The Springboks, of course. They're topical. Very good evening to you, South African, those watching around the world. My name is Blaine Herman, and this is Ed's Topical, our digital audience with us tonight. Among them, good to see them. Among them, our guest as well. I'm looking forward to getting their questions for our guests in a short while. Sport has a power to change the world. Nelson Mandela said that. But is it a sustainable change? Does it give a fragmented society a sense of belonging or is it just 80 minutes of patriotism that we back to our, our quarters of comfort? The Springboks World Cup win. Heart in your throat type stuff. Historic. Conjuring up a sense of pride and hope. But how do you quantify the chias in the context of nation building? Captain Sia Khaleesi says in his book Rise, if you believe, work hard and grab opportunities and resources that come your way, you can rise and you will rise. Question, how can we use the momentum gained from this World Cup to get us over life's gain line? That's the question. But we're also asking this in terms of the question of the week. We're asking you, what's rugby doing right that other sporting codes could emulate? Let's take you to the magic wall. How do we enhance or harness the power of sport in order to effect change for good. How best can we use the power of sport as a tool for social change? Let us know at its topical SABC. Perspective coming up. All right, as always, context really important on this program. And let me turn to the magic wall. But to help me do that, I want to invite SABC News sports journalist Tandem Koli uh, onto set. Thank you, good sir, for making the time. Woosa. <laughs> We're yeah. still on a high. Definitely, yeah. Uh, but let's run through and give the viewers some context. Four time, how historic is this? Very historic because no other team in the world has managed to get four titles. We were tied on three with New Zealand up until last night when we beat them in the final. Um, also, this also brings other stats into play. For example, Sia Colisi becomes the first Springbok captain mm. to have two World Cup titles mm. under his belt. Three captains have won it. And yeah. um, it's, it's, it's stats like that, for example, that you look at. Um, also, first, it's, it's, yeah. it's a second nation to, to win back-to-back -back titles after New Zealand right. achieved that feat in 2015. So it's, it's a very significant yeah. number and, and, and a milestone that has basically um, seen us uh, break into new ground. Right. And it's not only 
the men that are having success. It cuts across, right? And this leads to our question in terms of what can other sporting codes learn from rugby? Uh, how can they emulate the successes here? Um, I, I think a, a lot of it with rugby, let's not, let's not get things wrong. Mm. Um, rugby has not always been good. Right. Um, they've had to self-correct um, in the last decade. Um, well, especially if you look at women's uh, rugby, um, there, there wasn't a lot of resources put into women's rugby, mm, mm. but they've, they've kind of reshuffled the funds and said, for example, at under 13 level at Craven Week, th those teams are no longer funded mm, by mm. SA Rugby. That's more money that's gone into women's rugby. It's, it's financial models like that that have basically helped, at least you can employ better people right. to coach at, uh, at, at women's rugby. You, yeah. can, you can sustain and, and contain a lot more professionals. Yes, we're not at the level we would like to be, mm. but we've seen great strides. For example, the Bulls have shown this year what can happen when you have when you approach a women's rugby with a professional attitude and you, yeah. you put your mouth on your money as you mm. treat women as equally as, as the men, right. um, the results are very evident uh, for everyone to right. see. Uh, Recorrecting some of the issues. I'll get to that in a short while in terms of our journey here. But the symbolism, it was, wasn't always accepted as it is now. Maybe in some quarters, it's still not accepted. Uh, run through it. Um, basically, uh, if you look at the traditional stuff, for example, the protea, mm -hmm. that is normally the symbol for the national teams, right. all the national teams. Um, then, uh, this would be obviously the, the SA Rugby logo, yeah. but this is where things you, you get muddled up. Um, around the mid-90s, there was a, a, a meeting with all the unions. Um, mm. Remember, we had different unions because of race, class, and mm. everything. That, that, that meeting basically had to conclude for example, the protea would be the national symbol for the national teams. Right. Then the rugby issue became, came to the fore, and that was a divisive, divisive uh, part of the, mm -hmm. of the conversation, where eventually the former state president, Nelson Mandela, said, leave the identity of rugby, the Springboks, it mm -hmm. can be a unifying force, it's something that we can see as something that can be used as a, a uniting tool. Right. Yes, in the past it represented all that is not good, but this can be something that can help the nation and help us heal from the wounds of the past. Yeah. And in, in those conversations, the Springbok was, was maintained mm. as a national symbol for the rugby team um, with all the heritage that people basically were talking about in terms of fighting for the different identities. Yeah. But even then, when you talk about identities, you need to look beyond just the symbol. Right. There has to be action behind those um, okay. symbols. So that, that is a, that, that's another area where I had a lot of gripe for the rugby because mm -hmm. it was a numbers thing. Let's tick boxes. How many, the code says, let's have, let's have four starting black players. Yeah. And in that, a lot was, was lost because it was not always genuine. Mm. The people tasked with picking teams, selecting representative teams, ticked boxes not because they believed in the player's ability, but they were just getting through the process. Mm. And that took a while to get rid of, whereby the mindset right. was transformed. It take, it's, it's taken a better part of two decades mm. to, to, to ease um, everything. But still, you, you do find some quarters um, yeah. where, where it's not as open. But so where's the problematic areas here? In the, in the past, let's say in the last decade, um, Executive level, mm. there was a, a big problem with administration because even though rugby was a strong brand, commercially, there's a, there's a if you look at the 2014, 2017 yeah. period, commercially, SA rugby was not doing as well. And a lot of people blamed the leadership for it, but it goes beyond that. Outside of the executive, you've got the different unions, mm. which are, are managed by individuals. Ideally, you'd have to have someone with the business nows and financial nows right. to, to, to be able to manage funds and, and create the right partnerships so that there's sustainable money to promote, um, for example, to, to build schools, to, yeah. to nurture the talent coming yeah. through and make sure everything is going in the same, the same direction. It has not always been the case whereby people are occupied positions. They never did what was best mm. for, the, for the union, knowingly or unknowingly. Um, whether they've got the, they have the skills or not, that's another debate for another yeah. day. We're talking about the end result. So if you look at the period between 2014 and about 2017, that's when we suffered the most. Mm. Um, because, for example, the, 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 the error that you talk about now with Rassi Erasmus, when yeah. he came in, he did not work under those conditions that an Alistair Kutsia would have worked right. under. He had more money um, whereby he can go scout and he can go um, do rickies and find better 
better conditions for mm. his players and, and, and work on programs that can suit the national narrative. Right. Other coaches never had that, that, that opportunity. So we had to find more money. And the right people went to the right doors and knocked. And the, the right commercial partners yeah. saw the vision and invested in, in especially the Springbok brand. Because mm. they said if you get the top right, eventually everything will trickle down to where it's supposed to be. Right. But what about down up? And this is where it becomes important for me as well in terms of making it accessible to all. I'll speed this up so I can give you a sense of where I think it's really important here. Youth participation, grassroots from the bottom up. And not only in rugby. I mean, you need to grab them when they're young and nurture them. Resources, infrastructure, you know, invest. Is that happening though? It is. Um there's enough youth, um, and especially representative youth, um, playing a rugby at a different levels. Mm. The problem with, with the rugby is when you start transi transitioning from under 19, under 20 to professional rugby. Right. So that, that, that's when you play for your representative yeah. teams. Those guys, that's where a lot of unfair decisions were made, whereby mm. the wrong talent was backed. And the wrong people went into the into professional systems, and a lot of talent was lost because people were disheartened and found themselves even behaving out of character because they felt they felt marginalised. Mm -hmm. So in terms of youth, if you look at the represented at, at the Craven Week, Grand Gorm under 16 yeah. week, um, if you look at under 18 as well, even under 13, if you look at the makeup of those teams, they're not they're actually very equal mm. um, in terms mm. of how the, the how we'd like um, our rugby teams to, 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 to look like. Right. But the older you get and the closer you get to professional rugby, that's when the, the demographic starts changing, especially mm. when you transition from under 21 to representative teams. Right. Yes, there have been measures in, in, in terms of introducing coaching systems to, to, to equal the playing field. But ultimately, yeah. exposure needs a player needs exposure and they need to be given mm. the time to develop and become a, a professional player. Always instructive, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Go and rest. <laughs> no rest for the <laughs> Tano Mkoli, SABC News sports journalist there. Very, very informative. we blessed to have him on our side. All right. Our regular Word on the Street feature where we ventured to four ways, Monte Casino, you know that was buzzing, uh, lively crowds of rugby enthusiasts as well as new fans, right, gathered last night, saw their reaction on the role of rugby as a unifying force in society, and this is what they had to say, watch. That's the beauty of sport, it brings people together, it unites people, and it just, it, it gosh, it's euphoric. Just because we support the same country, yes. now we have a bond together, and I think it's a lovely sport that like unites the country and we all come as one. And I think it's just an amazing sport that it brings the country together. Rugby is accessible to all races. So I think that's where, that's where the whole thing about bringing people together because even people who don't have resources they can see or in their villages, they still play rugby compared to the guys who go to motor seal schools or private schools with all the resources. So you've got you've got a sport that's being played by everyone. Rugby can unite, not only rugby, it's all sport that can unite people. It always has done since 1995. It united this country and it's, gonna, it's doing it again. Whenever it is rugby, if you have noticed all the colors, all the ages, we come together to be one. And that is what rugby represents to me, the unity, the fight that Mandela fought for. It is coming to life, especially during rugby time. Saying rugby unites you. I've made so many different friends tonight. Nobody had tables, they were overcrowded. We all joined together and just made friends. It's really beautiful to see such a rainbow nation come together. Like I said, it's not DNA, it's RSA. There's no race, there's no color. All right, we do appreciate your thoughts from last night. Let's continue the discussion. Lots to discuss in terms of digging a little deeper into the state of play, so to speak. Uh, we have a number of guests, former Springbok prop and SABC sports analyst Lawrence Sapaka. Sir, thank you very much for your time. How are you? Very well, better than I deserve. <laughs> um, we also have Lita Mpondwana, 
Uh, he's from the Sports Art and Culture Ministerial uh, Spokesperson. Uh, also, we're hoping to have uh, former Springbok uh, coach Peter De Villiers and also our digital audience here as well. Some of which are joining us all the way from New Zealand. I think it's about, what, six o'clock in the morning. Uh, Monday morning in New Zealand, but we really appreciate them. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Lawrence, to you first. I mean, <laughs> what, three consecutive one-point victories. What would you put it as in terms of how do we keep on getting over the line as, as a team? Uh, evening uh, to the viewers as well. I think uh, if you look at the first one, that was a, a real arm wrestle. We played against a very, very good team which I think the Springboks found a way every time they got punched, they found a counter punch and to come back and stay within the fight because that's all I needed to do mm. to manage 80 minutes a long time but get a very short time if you're not getting points on the board. And they actually did exactly that. And by the time they did that, mm. they, they stayed so close that they forced actually France to go into a panic mode yeah. and to a point where they actually got on top of the game. If you look at every two minutes, mm. The Springboks were literally, that's the first two minutes they managed to take control of and actually own. And France had nothing to offer after that. And then basically, you could sense at that point that uh, we're going to actually wrap this one and go home with it. Right. But we thought that there's also luck got a lot to do with it. But like I said, the harder you work sometimes, mm. the luckier you get. Mm. That's what we put it down to. Mm. Earlier on, we were speaking with Tando with regards to the journey that the Springboks had mm. to come through over the years since 95. Uh, how has that journey shaped to what we saw last night? Since 95, I think a lot has happened. Uh, a lot of uh, skill, a lot of different characters have come mm. through. A lot of coaches, a lot of processes have come through in terms of moving the game forward. Remember, the game is moving. Mm. So if you don't move with the game, you tend to be found to be stuck in sort of the past. The past is important because it's a history that we all learn from. Mm -hmm. But you need to always look ahead as well, how to take the past and merge it with the future and bring the youngsters in modern times and how they actually adjust to the modern game. But you could see the mix there. I mean, uh, Coach Rassi really pushing the barriers. Mm -hmm. First of all, selecting multiple players playing the same position in one team, which is not unheard of, yeah. but utilizing differently. I mean, this is just the nature of the game. Some coaches thinking, man, they don't even, they even confused, mm -hmm. confused mm -hmm. as to what the role of a winger, what the role of a center is. At the end of the day, remember if you're a rugby player, the certain basics that you, be able, you are able to, you are required to be able mm. to do, although you still got your core job to do as a rugby player. Right. And that's how rugby has actually progressed. Yeah. Let me bring in Lita. Um, with regards to, look, we spoke about the issue of grassroots resources, infrastructure, uh, the bottom up, as well as the top down. Uh, somewhere in the middle, we need to have facilities in order to nurture talent that's coming through because there's ample talent around the country. Um, what, what's government doing in order to harness this? Well, good evening, Blaine and the viewers. Um, one of the priorities of Minister Zizi Godwa in his tenure as Sports, Arts and Culture Minister um, has been to deepen um, the investment in development of sports. And uh, central to that has been investing in rural sport development and those underserviced communities. Mm. So over the past several months, especially, um, we've seen um, initiatives where um, the ministry and the department have been going around the country developing multi-purpose sports courts um, in underserviced communities in the, around the country and in villages, which is where we believe you'd find that unhidden talent and, and then enable them to be nurtured from the bottom up. Mm. Um, the minister has said, of course, that government can't do it alone. And his rallying call has been both for the public sector and the private sector to work together to further make this a reality where around the country, um, um, sports federations could go to the deepest of communities in the country and unearth talent just to further enhance South African sport. Because sport plays a great role in fostering national unity as seen in the spring box and building social cohesion mm. is that happening lawrence at a pace where you satisfy in terms of going to every corner of this country to unearth talent talent uh, listen south africa is, is not not shortage in terms of talent mm. reproduction mm. there's a whole lot of it and actually we've got so much that actually not even the surface has been scratched if you really had to look at the whole 
um, Rainbow Nation, obviously in terms of uh, diversity, mm. we are not meeting the numbers of how many people should be participating, but we've got still the most compared to other countries in terms of how much you pro we produce so much. I think the French or European countries, sometimes you'll find them here with our local competition coming to scout and giving some youngsters opportunities to go play overseas and will mm. eventually represent those countries as well. We've got so many. We, in a situation where New Zealand is actually harnessing talent, where we're missing talent because we get clouded mm. by the shine of a certain one at a certain time that actually means that at a rough diamond that's probably not polished. Mm. And I suppose creating an environment where uh, these players will all be exposed to the same kind of uh, sporting activities at exactly the same time. Maybe the scope will be so open, a lot of avenues created for them to participate. We've got too much. Mm. I don't think we've got enough competition for them to participate in. I mean, for instance, now obviously government being involved as well. I think one avenue that's really missed a trick in terms of from their side yeah. is to communicate with the education department. Right. I mean, if you look at sports, start there. Mm. I mean, when we grew up, if you're not involved in sport, what were you doing? Mm, mm. And then that's exactly that what kept you busy after school, obviously after sports, and then you'll go home and go do your homework. Yeah. Now they've got too much time. And obviously with social media playing a role, times are different. Right. So now obviously those things need to be curtailed somehow to get these youngsters and engage them. Right. And we're dealing with different kind of youngsters. I mean, there's no corporate partnership mm, anymore. Mm. Teachers need to run <laughs> very fast when the kids start looking at them in the yeah. eyes. Start wondering. I mean, the, obviously, times have changed. Yeah. Need to find uh, innovative ways to engage them, get them involved. But in, uh, most importantly, just get them involved in something. Yeah. There's a whole lot of sports that one can do. And sometimes money is not really the necessary one, but putting foundations yeah. and uh, possib I mean, sort of infrastructure where these kids don't have to pay for something mm. to be able to do it. I mean, if money is required, they must be able to push a button somewhere. Say, so listen, there's some great talent, but we're, not, we're short here, here. Can you assess in yeah. terms of moving them? Maybe that's where the private sector mm. needs to also get involved, some CSI and helping these youngsters. Yes, I mean, you've seen with the Olympics. Yeah. I mean, the stories that you sometimes hear about players need to cover out of their own pocket, but yet on the other side, you're representing your country. Mm -hmm. Then, you know what I mean, who's, who, who, I mean, is a dog take, is yeah. taking the tail or the tail taking mm -hmm. the dog? Mm -hmm. It's one of those situations of which I understand to represent your country is very important. Yeah. And how you represent your country as well, you need to do it with pride. And actually, when you're doing it as well, you need to understand what you're doing is laying a foundation for the next generation to come right. and do it better. But how better to do it when you're happy? Yeah. Um, let's bring in Rudolf. Rudolf Lowe, uh, speaking about pride, uh, wh what do you think yesterday's win did for South Africa as, as a whole? Um, I think as a box supporter, you know, it's just something to be proud of, to be proud of your team winning. Um, and I think it gives South Africans a bit of hope, you know. For one day, you don't have to worry about anything else. You can just be happy about the box winning Rudolf, for the next you, four years. You're currently in New Zealand, correct? Yep, I'm currently in New Zealand. We appreciate you getting up early for us. Uh, what was it like watching the game yesterday in New Zealand? Um, Where your heart is split. <laughs> like it. um, it's not the same atmosphere as in South Africa. Um, I think in South Africa you have Bok Friday and everybody is excited for it. Over here there's not as much going on and mm. people is not as excited for the rugby as in South Africa. Uh, Lawrence, do you think, uh, I mean, the New Zealand's formidable foe of uh, you know, South Africa, um, but in terms of their rugby and how they've been over the years, has it lost a bit of shine in terms of back home and the excitement for that national team? Well, you cannot doubt that New Zealand is also one of the forerunners in terms of innovation, in terms of the game is moving forward. They probably play some of the mass open rugby, but mixing their physicality and their skill as well. They probably got uh, it right at some point. But obviously, the, the change of guard sometimes, the different philosophies, they come and tend to play a certain role mm. in how a, precision, uh, a transition is taking place. Remember, New Zealand is a proud nation. I mean, I hear what he's saying about the excitement is not that great, mm. but I think if you're in a right community mm -hmm. that's actually proud about the game, you don't say anything wrong about the old blacks. You don't say anything that's obscured. Mm. You don't actually challenge them or actually criticize them too much to not validate because they will get into you. Yeah. That's how proud they are. Right. And obviously, as critical as that may be, when the old blacks are not doing well, they can easily just close the door, close it, and walk the opposite mm. direction. That's how passionate they are. This thing. When the team is not doing well, 
they're sort of easy to go into a shell or depression sort yeah. of a thing. I can imagine how they're feeling after the effort they've put in against the Springboks currently. Mm. It was a well, 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 uh, I mean, that game was beautiful. It's a low scoring game. Yeah. But in terms of our intensity of that game, it was from minute one to minute 80. If they cannot galvanize themselves as a nation to understand in every situation in sport, mm. there has to be a winner and a loser. You're not guaranteed a win mm. until you really cross the line at the end of the thing. They had opportunities. Unfortunately, certain things happened in process. Mistakes happened. Yeah. But don't crucify your team. They did very well. They, I mean, they, they started very slow coming to this campaign, yeah. but they got momentum. We were actually worried about them. We know what they're capable of. And maybe South Africa, the one uh, mishap, we almost probably missed the trick. Mm -hmm. It's after France, when you realize you're going to play New Zealand, maybe in the final, if you pass England. We mm -hmm. tend to put one foot in, there, in that pot, yeah. and one was in, in England's pot, and then that's where the mistake probably happened. They wouldn't say that to mm -hmm. us, though, mm -hmm. because they know that's not the, how you prepare for a game, international game for that matter. Yeah. But you can tell, I mean, the, 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 the mean the attitude they were playing is against England. It was uncharacteristic of a Springbok going to a major kind of situation. Yeah. But then, flip-flop, yeah. a game later, you would actually forgotten that actually there's this thing that happened against England. Yeah. It was a totally different game against All Blacks. Right. Anga, uh, how did you feel last night when you saw Sia Kulisi raising that cup? You saw the president raising the cup. What ran through your mind? Um, greetings, everyone. Um, sheesh. Wow. <laughs> Yesterday was very... Yeah, it was very, it was very, very wonderful to experience. I think the country needed it. Um, the box showed that you can come from nowhere and you can conquer whatever you want to conquer. Mm -hmm. I mean, they came from losing to, to Ireland, who are, who are deemed to be the best team in the world. And everyone thought they would have done enough for us because everyone thought there's no way we're going to go to the quarterfinals and beat France in France. But they did it. They went to England, um, were supposed to win the game easily. It was tough. And then everyone thought, ah, there's no way we're going to do it again. Mm. Three weeks in a row, one point, there's no way we're going to do it again. Against the OFO, New Zealand. But the boys pulled through. They showed that when we come together as uh, as a collective, as a country, when, when we fight for one thing, which is what rugby instills in everyone, that you should fight for a common goal, have something in mind, and it's not it's always about you, it's about the man next to you. You're fighting for the jersey, never yeah. for yourself. Right. So, I think it means a lot for us. Thank you. Captain Khaleesi said after the game that uh, this is what diversity is all about. He says uh, this team shows what diversity can do, and if we all work together, uh, all things are possible, yeah? Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will get your, your take in terms of your comments. We've asked you the question is, what can other sporting co uh, codes learn from rugby? What is rugby doing right that others can emulate? Let us know at its topical SABC. Quick break, more next. Many are still on a high after that win yesterday. Record-breaking, historic. You saw the reaction from France all the way here in South Africa. Some can't explain how they felt when they saw Sia Khaleesi lifting up that cup. Fourth win for South Africa. Hasn't been done ever. So let's talk about that. How can we use that feeling? How can we make it last? Uh, for good. Where are the avenues of opportunity? Let's discuss with our guests. Let me just go to Lita. Lita, um, with regards to, here's the pushback, I guess. Some would say, oh, this is nothing more than 80 minutes of patriotism. And then we all go back, you know, to our corners of comfort. Things go back to normal. How can we use this, this feeling, this euphoric feeling now in order to affect change? Well, Blaine, um, if I may, um, this has been not just a great year for rugby. This is a very significant moment, but during the years, while well, we've seen other instances where um, the women's cricket protest oh. team made the finals of the World's, World's T20 Cup for the first time, and we've seen Banana Banana play well as well. 
So those important are very, those moments are very important in building that social cohesion. But then they also should, they should also serve as a motivation for a greater investment in developing sport in the country, just to see, just for us to realize what is possible on the sports front. Yeah. Um, so it is the hope that um, with all the successes in sport that we've had this year, um, with the Springboks winning their record fourth World Cup um, as the peak moment of the year and the Proteus also doing well in India, that would see a greater invest, greater intent and greater investment in those partnerships that can deepen the investment in, in developing rural um, 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 sport in rural communities, um, building facilities um, in communities which do not have access to those facilities. Yeah. And also just to touch on the point um, Mr. Lawrence Sipaka um, raised, a very important point of the need for greater collaboration between um, education and sport. Um, just to just to make effect um, to great, great greater partnerships to to realize the aims of develop of developing school sport in the mm-hmm. country, um, because recently we had a school sport in Daba, which the department hosted, um, where that agreement was made, where there was going to be more collaboration and more and and a more effective intent between government, the private sector, and civil society, just to just to um, develop um, school sport mm-hmm. in a more collaborative way, and also to use sport as a key essential um, to. To, to educate and 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 to and to make the country a more active nation. Right. Another uh, point as well. Go on. Um, the minister also has also mentioned um um the the importance of 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 realizing sport as a tool um as as an economic as an economic tool. Mm. So it's not just um a way to bring in the economy by hosting mega events um by 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 by, by us um focusing on 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 our major sports people, but it's also a very important tool in terms of sports tourism, just to bring people into the country, just to right. make sure that um when we have our major events in sport that. Um, sport is able to contribute to the country's economy. So there are those multifaceted um, yeah. um, um, issues at stake when, with regards to sport. And that's how we could build sport, not just to be a moment where we celebrate our big triumphs, but to build a more sustainable um, a means of development for the country through Correct. sport. Multi-prong. Um, important. Rudolf Lowe, you, I understand, played some rugby here in South Africa. Um, talk to us about your experience. I'm not sure why you left. Uh, but uh, talk to us about the experience you gained here and where do you see the avenue of opportunity? Where do you see the, the need for improvement? Um, I think, obviously, in South Africa, there's a lot of players playing rugby. So there's a pool of heaps of players rugby. Where over here in New Zealand, there's only a few players. So they focus more on developing players, developing their potential. Whereas in South Africa, it's just the best player at the time. For an example, on the 16, if you're on the 16, the best player, you're going to get picked. And then later on, when you come on the 20 or so, you're not the best player anymore. And they just pick up a new guy who's mm. the best player at that moment. So over here, it's more about developing players. Yeah. Uh, Anga, any interest in rugby after you saw what happened yesterday? Taking it up as a sport? <laughs> uh, I do play right there already. Um, I think 2019 showed me that there is some some there's hope in rugby because right. I used to play soccer before. So um, high high school, me getting to high school showed me that um, dibbling and dabbling in different avenues of sport would um, enhance me as a person. And I think rugby has been one of the most uh, helpful avenues that have made me grow as a person and. It helped me, it just helps, it just makes me realize that there is uh, a situation where I can play for something bigger than myself and where I can be cohesive with other people right. in the same realm. Uh, Lawrence, I mean, the, the comparison between 1994 and a present time, I mean, it's, some would argue it's different time, different circumstances back then. But do you think the win from last night, to what extent would it, spur on the next generation of rugby players as it did back in 95? Well, I can tell you now, in terms of numbers, it probably spurs on a whole lot more, probably the 60 million for that matter, mm. where back then it was probably a quarter or that probably had mm. access to the sport and actually was privy to the sport. But now, even the one who thinks, I cannot play this game mm. because of this and this and that, they can dare to dream as but see, I came from nothing, mm. and now he's leading the country and he's actually a world leader for the second time in a row for someone who came from 
humble beginnings and able to do that is giving those kids an opportunity to dream. Because at the end of the day, if you can get a child to dream, I mean, he was dreaming. I mean, the story now, we still mm. talk about it today. Scott Berger, we probably played in my time as well. He came and asked for an autograph as a youngster, mm. and he can never stop telling that story because he remembers him. Like, he played with him as well when he actually grew up as well. Just this an opportunity to give kids an opportunity to dream. Give opportunity to kids to participate. Yeah. Once you participate, remember, it's not about winning or losing, mm. but give someone something to actually wake up to and actually enjoy themselves, make friends. Because at the end of the day, you're talking about people making connections in business and yeah. life. Mm. Sport is actually the easiest way of building those blogs and everybody getting the opportunity to, to travel the world. And all of those things, they happen because mm. you've made yourself available to participate in sport. Like I said, I used to play soccer too before I was introduced to rugby. Right. Yeah. By the time 95 happened, I actually was two, gay, two years mm. into the system and actually I was still learning at that time as to what happened. It was in high school already. Mm. Mm. So it's just an exposure to different environment, different things, because you're not everyone is got those facilities around them all the time. Right. But giving that opportunity to participate in anything that is possible, you never know yourself. Mm. I never thought I'll be a rugby player. Right. Yeah. But I ended up being uh, probably representing my country, something I've never dreamed of. Right. You know, those are just opportunities they were saying as well. It's actually well said. Both of these youngsters are actually yeah. saying exactly what is happening. And I remember in the beginning I said harnessing and actually just looking for something that's already prepared. Mm. That's the difference between us and New Zealand. Yeah. But if you look at New Zealand, you'll think those guys are more skillful than us. No, it's not. Mm. It's hard work that people put in into individuals in developing them. We can create those environments, start with the schools. Yeah. And yeah. from the schools and then create an environment, there's the gaps. University, some go, some don't go. Mm. But then what happens to the ones who don't go to universities? Right. You don't want to lose them. Yeah. Uh, you know, Lita, in, in terms of the education department um, and, and, and certain schools, you, you can't only look at certain schools for talent, right? You, you need to cut across the country, uh, be it rural, be it urban. Uh, what, what, what efforts or what, what progress has been made in that regard? So it, 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 it is noted that um, a lot of the time, um, a lot of um, players or, or athletes who play, who make it to senior level, come from certain schools. Mm. But um, part of the investment into rural and, and underserviced communities is to try and break that cycle, just to not make it a, a necessity for someone to go and attend a well-resourced school um, to be able to make it as a, as a professional athlete at senior levels. Um, a few months ago, um, the minister visited the Boland region, mm. um, where he spent some time interacting with the union there, just to find out what they've been doing, because they've got um, a, a very strong grassroots rugby system, um, despite their limited resources. But then over time, they produced Springboks such as Kirtley Arensa, um, Grant Williams, and Kenneth Moody. So there are those, so so there are those um kind of in, in endeavors where we need just to build capacity and just to support um those communities that are doing a lot um to to try and develop talents with that with the limited resources just to empower them um to and, and to help them grow so that they can further deepen what they are doing. Um, what the minister has also been um, um advocating for and and we've been doing it for the past several months is just interacting um with other countries just to see what they've been doing mm. in terms of building their grassroots sports. Um, um, we've had um, engagements with New Zealand, um, England, Jamaica, um, who have all respectively in various ways um, developed strong um, 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 sports systems from youth level, yeah. um, athletes in Jamaica, rugby in New Zealand, and several sports in the, in the United Kingdom. And incorporating those into our own um, our own programs and our own curriculum as well, just integrating sport and education, as I said earlier on. Um, those will perhaps help um, further um, extend the pool of talent in which South Africa is able to develop sporting talents from grassroots level, right. so that you don't rely on just the world of resource schools, but also go deeper into the country and ensure that um, schools which are outside those oh, those top tier um, schools in terms of re economic resources are able to consistently prov um, provide athletes who can make it at a top yeah. level. Rudolf, when playing together, social differences tend to take a back seat. Um, from your experiences here in South Africa and, and in New Zealand as well, how have you seen sport being used as a tool to bring people together? More nation building, more social cohesion, less division. Um, I think yeah, sport has the power to connect people together. Um, I think when you play rugby, 
you're with your mates, you're playing with 15 different people and you don't care where they're from, what they're doing. Um, it's just about having a fun time together. And I think that carries off the field as well. Whereas rugby learns you the values to respect each other and to accept each other for who they are. Yeah. Uh, Anga, I mean, we all use Madiba's quotes, quotes from famous people with regards to how sport can harmonize, how sport can unify. But what would you like to see at a practical level, at a community level, in terms of using this euphoria uh, to better affect change? I think I'd like to see more tournaments that are specific to rural areas. Mm. Um, I'd like to see more more clinics that are specific to rural areas where coaches such as your Rasi Rasma, such as your Alistair Kutiers, they go down to a rural area and they teach these kids. They teach the coaches in these areas how to coach, what to do in order to become better. Um, I think that would help help the crop that is in the rural areas because there is talent there and that would make the box and South Africa better. Lawrence, head coach position for the Springboks. Who's next in line? Who's putting their hands up? What's the future holding for this team? Well, at this point in time, I think we probably must give them a few weeks just to bask in the glory <laughs> of all that hard work they've put through. And then I'm sure that's something they've been thinking about for some time. And obviously the transition plan, mm. progression plan as well. I wouldn't understand that they will go outside the group that they have. It would be a lot easier to pick someone within the group of coaching that they had just add some more to the system in order to just bolster the system and getting it strong and going forward. Wherever they probably had legs in terms of technicality, they can look at it. That's why Ras is still in the system. So he needs to foster that to make sure that's a progression going forward. I don't understand, though, if he probably needs to go as well. Mm -hmm. Because to thinking about it, if it's his job is to actually make sure that the, uh, the mother body is in a good state, he is actually controlling, running the ship, putting right people in right places and having a strong hold over them as well if things tend to run out of shape and then he's there to actually uh, assist as well. I mean, he's a hands-on. I mean, he's a director of rugby yeah. and he's actually been probably mostly hands-on. You'd sometimes forget he's supposed to be sitting in the office and let the coaches do coaching. Yeah. But he's become created an environment where it's not about the coach who does the coaching. It's a collective as players that need to be coercive in whatever they do. Coaches as well. It's very important. Everyone bring in their little bit of expertise yeah. add to develop. And if you listen to Jack himself, mm -hmm. and you tend to forget he's actually the head coach of the team when he talked about his department being the, the defensive. I mean, even someone else, stick is probably a tech and the other one is probably something else. Right. So basically, they need to find out the new head to spearhead the whole progression to the next four years. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're the world champions for the next four years. You need to actually get to a point where they need to maintain the stature. They need to maintain that um, momentum. Obviously, that integrity as well as world champions. So you're not taking steps back. Yeah. You're moving forward. But while moving forward, you're bringing in new blood. Yeah. You're blending in new players yeah. and managing the older players. And obviously, others are probably following up by the sideways. So those are all the things they need to consider. Right. But I'm supposed that's probably a conversation that's going to happen after the nine provinces have been yeah. visited in terms of right. uh, the trophy showing. Well, so I suppose yeah. at this point in time, we're in a hurry to see who's <laughs> uh, up next. Correct. But I suppose, I mean, it's got until let the end of December. It. Let them enjoy the yeah. moment. Yeah. And then they'll, they'll come to a time when they need to now start uh, throwing those bones and see who's one's pop. <laughs> Lita, maybe final word to you. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be an eventful week uh, coming up. What, from the Department of Sports point of view, uh, what's, what's on the cards? Um, so um, we're still in Paris with the minister, but mm. we're heading home. But um, we know on Tuesday the Springboks do arrive and the department will be supporting the Springboks on their trophy tours. So, so far, um, there, are, there, are, there, are, there is a trophy tour being planned um, from across the provinces. But on Tuesday, um, that's where the, build, the big welcome is, um, where the Springboks are returning to the country with wow. the trophy. And we hope to see um, the um, South Africans all enjoying this moment. Um, because I think if you go... Um, 
um, when you look back on this year, um, this is going to be perhaps the most significant year in in sport, at least in the, in, in this country's democracy. Yeah. Um, so we just need to celebrate this week and take all what you can. But then also at the same time as well, just consider all that you can take out this year to further develop sport um, in the country. All right. Uh, Lisa, thank you very much indeed. Rudolf, appreciate your time getting up early for us all the way in New Zealand. Anga, appreciate your time as well. Lawrence, always a pleasure thank having you. you on the program. All right, before we go, here's my take. Why are we not all on the same page about matters that affect all of us? Look at the pandemic, COVID, split us. Those for the vaccines, those against. I know, we are a community of individuals. Freedom of thought, of expression, of choice, important. But as a nation, how do we find and cherish our common principles that bind us and make us a major player on the African continent, on the world stage? Let's always remember how the Springboks made us feel, how united we were in that pursuit of feeling better about ourselves, in our pursuit of pride as a nation.